Brilliant. Hi, everyone. Thanks to Roy Castle and BTOG for asking me to speak today. So I got the sort of bits and pieces talk, really. Um, but anyway, we are where we are. So before we start, everyone shows pictures of Chicago when they go to Chicago. It's a lovely city, and they put big skyscrapers or beams or whatever they put. So I took this on the shores of Lake Michigan, which is a beautiful lake if you've never been there. This sort of sign of domestic bliss. Um, these two adults, so anyone know what they are? Yeah, they're Canada geese. I, I really didn't know much about Canada geese. But apparently, well, subsequently it turns out they're very aggressive, these beautiful looking animals. And about three seconds after the flash went off to take that picture, the two big buggers chased me halfway around the lake. <laughs> so there was blood in this picture. So, as Sanjay said, I've got this sort of neoadjuvant neo radical talk today. So there's one on adjuvant chemotherapy. There's one on concurrent chemo radiotherapy with or without metformin. And then there's two on neoadjuvant immunotherapy, which are quite interesting. So we'll start with the chemotherapy talk. This was a JPANG study, as you imagine from the name, a Japanese study, randomized phase three, looking at pemetrexid cisplatin as a potential competitor for navalbine cisplatin in the adjuvant setting. So the rationale behind the study was, as you know, that pemetrexid platinum has been shown to be beneficial in the stage four setting. We know that patients with non-squamous cancer do a little bit better with pemetrexid-based doublets rather than other third-generation doublets. And the, the, the premise of the study really was to see if that translated in the adjuvant setting to a, an improved benefit over what we already use, which is navalbean cisplatin. So here's the eligibility criteria, as you might expect. Fit patients, performance status 0, 1, any stage from 2 to 3A that have undergone a cancer operation, including mediastinal nodal sampling, randomised to four cycles of vinorobine cisplatin at 80 milligrams per metre squared, or pemetrexid cisplatin at a slightly lower dose, 75 milligrams per metre squared. And the primary endpoint was recurrence-free survival. As you might expect, fairly standard sort of data set for this sort of study, median age around 65, all PS01, majority, particularly in Japan, overwhelming majority, adenocarcinomas. Because the only thing of note is at the bottom here, something we wouldn't necessarily expect in a UK data set, just about a quarter of patients were EGFR mutation positive, and we'll talk about those in a second. So here's the primary endpoint. This is recurrence-free survival, and you can see that the two curves for the two arms are virtually superimposed. <coughs> so no difference in recurrence-free survival between the two arms. If you look at subgroup analysis, something relatively interesting falls out. So I've highlighted here the mutant wild type groups, and it seems as though the EGFR mutation positive patients do a little bit better with the vinorobine doublet as opposed to the pemetrexid doublet, which may be a little bit counterintuitive given what we just said about pemetrexid in the advanced disease setting. Wide confidence intervals, but a suggestion at least that those patients do better with an older-fashioned doublet. If you look at recurrence-free survival by mutation status, this is wild type, so EGFR mutation positive, and you can see, again, the curves are very similar. In fact, pemetrexid curve numerically, at least, sitting above the vinorobine curve. If you look at the mutation-positive patients, again, it just actually rather surprisingly, I think, shows at least graphically the mutation-positive patients appear to be doing a little bit better with the vinorobine based doublet. Overall survival, no difference again between the two arms. So those curves virtually superimpose over each other. I didn't see any evidence or data presented on OS for the EGFR mutation positive patients. I had a look, I couldn't find it. I suspect that isn't, that isn't in the public domain. If you look at rate of completion, well, I think we know that navalbean cisplatin is quite a tough schedule. Most of my patients will get three cycles and then stop, and that's borne out by the study too. So in terms of numbers, numbers of patients getting four cycles, three quarters with the vinorobine cisplatin regimen, nearly 90% with the pemetrexid regimen. So it seems to be a treatment that's better tolerated. And in terms of safety, again, what we might expect to see, hematological toxicity much lower in the pemetrexid cisplatin arm. And if you look then at things like alopecia and febrile neutropenia, again, 
significant reductions in these significant toxicities for patients in the pemetrexid cisplatin arm. So febrile neutropenia, grade 3, 11.6% in the venorobine arm, 0.3% in the pemetrexid arm. So much less toxic as a schedule. Again, neutrophil count, white blood cell count and anemia, all better in the pemetrexid arm as we would expect. So the conclusion of the authors was that um, although there was no superiority to pemetrexid cisplatin in terms of re uh, rec recurrence-free survival, which was the, the primary endpoint of the study, it did appear a much better regimen in terms of tolerability. More patients got four cycles, less patients had significant grade three or worse toxicity. What we do about the EGFR mutation positive patients I think is up for grabs. I think there may be some talks later on in the day about that. Um, I'd be interested to know the feelings of my colleagues who treat lung cancer with adjuvant chemotherapy, whether there's enough there to switch from venorobine cisplatin to pemetrexid cisplatin, and we can talk about that at the end of the talk. Um, I guess to put it in context, a result, in, certainly in terms of overall survival, that or, or disease-free survival, we shouldn't really be surprised about. So this is, e, uh, this is E1505, which was the study looking at whether the addition of Avastin to doublet chemotherapy was beneficial in the adjuvant setting. The curves on the left of your screen, or probably the right of the screen as you're looking at it, break down the study by doublet regimen. And hidden in there, somewhere in green, is the cisplatin pemetrexid doublet. And you can see that in E1505, certainly on subgroup analysis, there was no benefit to platinum pemetrexid over any other doublet use. So I suppose the results from JPANG are not that surprising given the data we have already. So I think it's fair to say that pemetrexid cisplatin is at least as effective as venorobine cisplatin, certainly on a population basis. It's less toxic. The EGFR mutation observation that the venorobine cisplatin seems to be a more active combination is interesting, but I think is unlikely to be practiced changing, certainly given the fact that there's a whole raft of trials coming through looking at targeted therapies in this particular group of patients. And I suspect some of my colleagues may be talking about that later on. So that's JPANG. So concurrent chemo radiotherapy for lung cancer. This is NRGLU1001. And this is concurrent chemo radiotherapy for locally advanced non-small cell cancer, plus or minus metformin. Now, there's been a lot of noise about metformin, certainly in the tumour sites that I treat. On a cellular level, metformin blocks mitochondrial respiration. And there's lab data to suggest that that might activate tumour suppressor pathways, it might inhibit the cell cycle, and there may be some enhancement of response to systemic chemotherapy, particularly in lung cancer patients. And there's a little bit of, I wouldn't call it clinical data, more population-based data, suggesting that metformin may be protective in some way. So this is a, a meta-analysis of diabetes studies, studies looking at patient populations with diabetes having particular treatments. And in this particular meta-analysis, they combine the results of three of these data sets and looked at lung cancer incidence and showed that lung cancer incidence in patients on metformin was lower in, in diabetic patients than patients on some of the more modern treatments or on insulin. The Japanese did a, a much smaller study looking at patients on treatment for stage 3 and stage 4 disease, chemotherapy treatment. It's only about 90 patients, and what they did was look at patients' outcomes based on whether they were on metformin, a newer oral antihypoglycemic or insulin. And that curve there, that survival curve there, is the metformin group. So this is retrospective data. This, was, this is not anything that would certainly mandate you prescribing metformin, but enough of an indication, I think, on the studies to suggest that a trial was warranted. If you look at the trial schema, then patients got sort of fairly standard North American concurrent chemo radiotherapy, 60 grain, 30 fractions uh, with chemotherapy. In the study arm, there was a short dose escalation phase of metformin taking you up to, up to 2,000 milligrams a day, and the metformin then continued through 
the induction chemo radiotherapy phase and the adjuvant chemotherapy phase thereafter. So if you look at, the, look at it graphically, then here's your dose escalation phase. 1,000 milligrams week one, if tolerated, 1,500 milligrams week two, and then starting 2,000 milligrams alongside your concurrent chemo radiotherapy, and then two cycles of consolidation treatment, again with that higher dose of metformin uh, to complete the treatment schedule. Primary objective was progression-free survival. Would there be a progression-free survival advantage with the addition of metformin? And the study closed, having recruited around about 85 patients in each arm. And the demographics of the patients are what you might expect for this sort of study. So median age was around 65. All PS01, majority were white, as this is a North American study. And around about two-thirds of patients were stage 3A as opposed to stage 3B. One might expect that metformin, particularly at a dose of 2,000 milligrams, would have more toxicity, particularly gastrointestinal toxicity. But actually, if you look at the, the table that sort of displayed the toxicity uh, picked up from patients on the study, then in the no metformin arm, there was a relatively low rate of GI toxicity, but a very similar low rate in the metformin arm. So on the face of it, it appeared that metformin didn't add very much in terms of additional toxicity, which is quite surprising. Having said that, when you look at metformin compliance, you see quite a different picture. So only 63% of patients completed metformin as per protocol. So dose escalated up to 2,000 milligrams and then continued that dose till the end of their induction chemotherapy. Good number of people required a dose modification, over 60%. So although the toxicity data collection suggests this is a relatively safe non-toxic addition to chemo radiotherapy, the actual metformin compliance data strongly suggests that something else is going on and maybe they're missing something. If you look at progression-free survival, so this is all patients, patients who completed metformin and patients who didn't complete full-dose metformin. Then here's the no metformin arm, Here's the metformin arm in red, and I think you can see progression-free survival, numerically at least, is probably better in the control arm, but certainly no statistical difference between the two. They did an unplanned analysis as well of patients who were able to complete the metformin as per protocol. And again, no significant difference between the two arms. If you look at overall survival, you see a very similar thing. So this is intention to treat analysis, all patients in the study. This is metformin as per protocol, so 2,000 milligrams up to the end of induction chemotherapy. Numerically, at least, or graphically, a suggestion that the metformin arm may carry some benefit, but certainly no statistical difference between the two, and this was not a planned analysis in the study. If you look at local regional failure <coughs> or distant failure in the intention to treat population, you see exactly the same thing, no difference between the two arms. And then cause of death. No metformin in blue, metformin in red. So death due to, due to disease, lower, it appears, at least numerically, in the metformin arm. But people are dying of other things, perhaps. So perhaps this ties into the compliance of metformin on the study, and maybe something else is happening here that we're not aware of. So the author's conclusions were that it was well tolerated, although I think one could argue that that, in fact, wasn't the case, given the compliance. In terms of endpoints for the study, there was no difference in outcomes, whether you had conventional chemoradiotherapy or chemoradiotherapy plus metformin. And a comment that disease-specific mortality appeared lower in the metformin arm. The caveat is people are still dying, but potentially of other things. One thing they did say... I guess is a positive outlook on the study, was that survival outcomes, in, even in the control arm with both arms of the study, in fact, were pretty high. 65, 66% two-year survival is good for stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer um, treated with concurrent chemoradiotherapy. And they went on to draw and compare and contrast with Pacific, which is the trial of adjuvant duvalumab in stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer, which, as you know, showed... Duvalimab outperformed concurrent chemo radiotherapy given alone. And one of the criticisms of Pacific was that the radiotherapy, the chemo radiotherapy bit of the trial, 
wasn't protocolized. So the treatment that was given there is unknown and probably very variable across the centers that were given. In the NRG study, the radiotherapy was very protocolized. The dose, the fractionation schedule, the volumes, the margins, the dose volume constraints to the normal tissues were all mandated in the protocol. And the author's reasonable conclusion was that that might explain the better uh, uh, outcome seen in the NRG study compared to Pacific. Putting that in context, I think, for those of us that are old enough, the chart, I think, the chart study was published around 1999 and should have been practice changing, but wasn't for, for reasons which we might discuss later. But in chart, the two-year median overall survival for patients with squamous cell carcinoma, which was the, the group that saw the biggest benefit, the two-year median overall survival was 33%. I think a lot has changed in that time. We now use PET scans, mediastinoscopy. So some of that advantage will be stage shift. Patients in 1999 that were stage four would now be, was, was stage three rather, would now be probably categorized as stage four. But even allowing for that, 33% versus 65% is a big improvement in two decades. So that's the concurrent chemo radiotherapy. So third bit and final bit, Neoadjuvant immunotherapy prior to radical surgery. Two studies to talk about. First of these, LCMC3. This is neoadjuvant atezolizumab in resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So these are patients who at the outset were deemed resectable prior to entry onto the study. And the authors said that, um, I agree, that the neoadjuvant setting does have some advantages. It allows you to get in there and hopefully address micrometastatic disease, which at the end of the day is probably what's going to kill people. Compliance is likely to be better because patients haven't had the physiological stress of going through surgery for their operation. Pathological response may be an early surrogate for survival, but we'll talk about that again in a second. I don't think that's entirely set in tablets of stone yet. And then clearly the disadvantages. It delays definitive treatment. It delays surgery. There's a risk of cancer progressing on treatment, so you may miss the window of opportunity for surgery. And there may be a potential for increased surgical complications as well. Immunotherapy is pretty safe, but it's not a walk in the park, particularly if you're using combination immunotherapy. So some patients may miss surgery simply because of toxicity related to their neoadjuvant treatment. So the background to this study and the others was really a pilot study published last year in the New England Journal, looking at a small cohort, I think 21 patients, treated with neoadjuvant nivolumab, which suggested it was safe. Um, patients tolerated it. The majority who had it got to surgery, and a good number of those patients had uh, a pathological response. So the amount of tumour seen in the tissue was reduced by nivolumab. So on the back of that, a whole raft of studies were, were designed and are, and are still ongoing now. If we look at LCMC3, so this is interim data, I should emphasize then. Uh, this is a slightly difficult slide to follow, but essentially patients came in screening and had the usual screening test that we would now all do. So CT scans, PET CT scans, and imaging of the brain. If they were fit for surgery, they had a biopsy and then two cycles of atezolizumab. They were restaged again in the same way, CT, PET CT, and brain imaging. And if appropriate, proceeded to surgery. There was an option to have adjuvant atezolizumab for up to 12 months after the surgery. Okay? And the primary endpoint was MPR at surgical resection or major pathological response. Now, that is the first thing that caught my eye when I discussed, when I was looking at this um, abstract at ASCO, because this isn't an endpoint I have to say I'm particularly familiar with. Um, a major pathological response came about really as an attempt to shorten the time from recruiting patients into study to getting answers. And the authors suggest that this might be a good surrogate endpoint for overall survival. And this was based on some work done a few years ago now, looking at outcomes of patients actually in chemotherapy trials treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to surgery. And the observation that in patients who had, as you might expect, I guess, more reduction or less viable tumour in their, in their respected specimens had a longer survival. 
And this ma major pathological response terminology came out of that data. And essentially what they showed was that if in your resected tumour, less than 10% of the cells were viable tumour cells, then that constituted a major pathological response and translated in retrospective data analysis to a longer survival. So the authors are saying that this is an appropriate and useful and surrogate endpoint that allows you to recruit to trials and get the answers more quickly rather than waiting, frankly, for patients to die from lung cancer. The patient demographics and, uh, were very, uh, I guess, standard for this sort of study. Again, median age around 65, performance status 0, 1. The majority were stage 2 and 3. They did SP142 PDL1 analysis. And they also did uh, 22C3, whichever way you did your PDL1 analysis, around of half of patients in the study were PDL1 negative. Okay? A handful of patients, EGFR and out positive too. So 90 patients at this point have had their induction immunotherapy, had their surgery, and have gone on to have their NPR assessment. The EGFR and ALP patients were taken out of this assessment, so this is all wild type. And what it showed was, this waterfall plot showed was that the vast majority of patients had some sort of response to induction immunotherapy. So this is pathological regression. <coughs> okay? And then this little corner down here, these are the patients that had less than 10% of viable tumour cells in their, in their resected tumours and therefore fell into the category of major pathological response. Okay? But most patients responding, to at least to a degree. What the authors then did was look at this pathological regression and correlate it with other potential uh, markers of activity. And the first thing they looked at was resist. So did resist measurements of the tumour immediately before surgery, after atezolizumab, correlate with what the surgeons took out. And as you might expect, it did. So there was a correlation between rhesus response and pathological regression, as you might expect. What about PDL1 expression? Well, PDL1 expression wasn't particularly correlated with response. So we've got PDL1 expression by 22C3 on the vertical axis, <coughs> pathological regression. The the, the x-axis almost works the, the other way. So here is 100% pathological regression. So these are basically uh, complete responses all the way through to, to zero here. And you can see there's a sort of scatter of pdl one expression across the sort of pathological regression <coughs> x-axis, which suggests that that pdl one correlation really isn't there, not in this study at least. What about tumour mutation burden? We know that tumour mutation burden in stage 4 has been shown to correlate with response to certain <coughs> immunotherapeutics. But again here, I don't think you need to be a statistician to see that with tumour mutation burden on the y-axis and pathological regression on the x-axis, there doesn't seem to be certainly not an obvious visual correlation between the two. In terms of adverse events, it's what you might expect for an, a PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor. There was no unusual signals, no worrying signals there. Around 5% of patients in this study um, had to stop treatment because of a treatment-related adverse event. So relatively low, low numbers. So the author's conclusions were that atezolizumab was well tolerated. There were no new safety signals from using it in the neoadjuvant setting. Patients responded. They had an NPR response rate of 19%. So 19% of patients, when the tumour was resected, had less than 10% of viable tumour cells in their cancer. Pathological regression correlated with resist regression on imaging. But NPR was observed irrespective of PDL1 expression. So in this study, PDL1 expression didn't seem to predict response to neoadjuvant atezolizumab. And the trial is now continuing to recruit uh, to its planned 180 patients. So that's the tezolizumab neoadjuvantly. We now move on to neoadjuvant nivolumab or nivolumab ipilimumab in the same disease set set setting. So this is the NEOSTAR study. So this is randomizing patients potentially resectable at the outset to either single agent nivolumab 
or ipinevo. And this is the trial design. So patients have either got nivolumab 3 milligrams per kilogram days 1, 15 and 29, or nevo ipi days 1, 15 and 29, and then progressed on through surgery. The inclusion criteria are very, very similar. They had to be resectable at outset, performance status uh, 0-1, so fit for treatment. The study hypothesis was that either single agent nivolumab or nevo ipi would produce an MPR. So they used this MPR sort of surrogate endpoint in their study too. This MPR rate will be greater than one that you might see with induction chemotherapy. And looking at the trials, they estimated that with induction chemotherapy, you should see about a 15% MPR rate. And there was a whole bunch of other secondary endpoints looking at um, immune responses and so on in the tumour. So in terms of patient recruitment, a couple of things fall out here. So 44 patients were randomised, of which 39 underwent curative surgery. Five patients didn't proceed to surgery. So the cohort's only 44 patients. So five is a fairly significant number. Four of those were in the combination arm. So four out of the 20-odd patients who got Nevo Ipi did not get to surgery. Now, there was a variety of reasons for that. Lack of resectability in one, progressive disease in another. One patient was deemed too high a surgical risk and a fourth one declined surgery. But that, as it may, four patients out of a relatively small cohort did not get to surgery, which on the face of it is a little concerning. If you look at the patient demographics and treatment, then again, it's exactly what you might expect. Majority were smokers. Um, a spread of stage, stage 1B, a third of patients, but patients with stage 3A were also included. Um, higher proportion of squamous cell than we've seen in some of the other studies uh, we've talked about, and almost everyone had mediastinal staging, which is very important for this sort of trial. In terms of surgery, again, I draw your attention to this number here, which is that of the patients randomised to ipinevo, 80% got to surgery. So... Small study, wide confidence intervals, but a suggestion that the dropout rate might be a little bit higher than we'd perhaps be prepared to accept in the clinical setting. So in terms of primary endpoint, the MPR rate, certainly the nevo ipi arm reached its primary endpoint. So seven patients had an MPR. In fact, six of those had a pathological complete response, which I think is quite impressive, I have to say. So of the patients that had neoadjuvant ipinevo, six of those, 38% of the cohort, had a pathological complete response. This is nivolumab, this is nivolumab ipilumumab. You can see that the, wall, the, the plots show that there's a proportion of patients who progress, there's a proportion of patients who respond, perhaps deeper responses in the combination arm, but broadly speaking, the two graphs look very similar. Evaluating response in patients having immunotherapy can be tricky at the best of times. When you're using it in the neoadjuvant setting of only over two cycles, then I think it adds a level of complexity, which means that using resist in this situation may not be uh, the optimum way forward. What they did show was that resist responses were associated with this MPR concept. So this is... MPR here, so percentage of viable tumour in bars, so the shorter the bar, the lower the amount of viable tumour left in the resected specimen, and these are rhesus responses here. And you can see the patients with the deepest rhesus responses, whether you're having nivolumab or nivolumab ipilimumab, generally are those that correlate with the least viable tumour on the resected specimen. So if you do your scan before surgery, after your induction immunotherapy, it does seem to give a reasonable correlation as to what you're likely to find post-operatively. A word of caution that I alluded to a second ago, and that's determining response with immunotherapeutics is not always straightforward. And this is a patient from the study who had pre-op nevo ipi and got enlargement of an N2 node, which on the face of it might make you think the patient has progressed and wouldn't be the best candidate for surgery. The patient did actually go ahead and have surgery, and what they took out of the node was not cancer. It was granulomatous tissue. So this patient has had some kind of nodal immune flare, immune, immune cell infiltrate into the node, which has enlarged the node, 
it's metabolic, metabolically active on PET and to all intents and purposes might look like progressive disease. So a word of caution, I think. In terms of treatment-related adverse events, very few actually. Uh, Nevo Epi, one patient had grade 3 diarrhoea. Um, in terms of surgical complications, the majority actually occurred in the single agent nivolumab arm. So air leaks in five, bronchopleural fistulas in two, one each of empyema, pneumonia, and pneumonitis. But remember, only 80% of the patients in the combination arm actually got to surgery anyway. <coughs> Looking at whether any markers that you could do pre-treatment may direct you towards selecting patients best suited for this treatment, well, this is PDL1 expression, and in this study, PDL1 expression did seem to be predictive of both radiological and pathological responses. This is baseline PDL1 status on the y axis. These are patients with stable disease or progressive disease, and they're all clustered around the low PDL1 expressions. These are the patients that responded, and you can see a good number have a higher expression of PDL1. Very similar story with percentage of viable tumor on resected specimens. So these are high expressors here, lower percentage of viable tumor on, expression on, on surgery compared to those uh, non-expressors. And again, <coughs> maximum pathological responses, MPR concept, or major pathological response, I should say. All of the patients really, pretty much, are in the high, PD high PDL1 expressing group. The low PDL1 expressing group didn't have any MPRs in it at all. So in this study, as opposed to the last one, PDL1 did appear to be predictive. So they concluded that both drug combinations, single agent nivolumab and nivolumab ip ipilimumab, uh, seemed to be active with MPR rates of 17 and 33 percent respectively. Toxicity was as you would expect for these agents, and there was no dramatic increase in perioperative or postoperative uh, morbidity or mortality. They did make a point of emphasizing this issue of nodal flare in the mediastinum, which did not turn out to be malignant, so something we will need to be cognizant of if these sorts of schedules ever do become embedded in a standard practice. And data which I've not shown you about T-cell inf infiltration into the tumor, Nevo Ipi did that more effectively than single agent nivolumab. How long have I got? Two minutes. I shall whiz. So, biomarkers for personalization of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. I think neoadjuvant trials are ideal at looking at biomarkers because you're taking the tumor out. So you have actually pathological tumor to actually look at. We lack biomarkers at the moment. The data I've shown you is a little bit equivocal in terms of whether PDL1 actually makes a difference. So I think in LCMC3 there was a correlation between NPR and PDL1. In Neostar there wasn't. The Ford data, which is that very small 20 patient study published last year, again, differing results. So PDL1 expression doesn't seem to robustly predict response to neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy. Tumor mutation burden 2 in LCMC3, that's neoadjuvant atezolizumab. No association in the Ford study, which was neoadjuvant nivolumab. The data I haven't shown you, there did seem to be association. So differing results again, depending on which small trial you look at. And this concept of major, pa major pathological response does seem to be consistent in the studies. However, I am not convinced at the moment there's enough data there for us to say as an oncological community that we can use NPR as a surrogate for overall survival in clinical trials. But again, I will be happy to be uh, corrected on that by my, my colleagues. So strengths of the study. Um, seem to be relatively effective, low toxicity, high resection rates, with the caveat of the nevo ipi arm uh, in the second study. However, these are small studies, and the caveats around NPR we've already talked about. I will mention one more study very briefly, which I think probably puts those two trials into perspective. This is the Nadim trial. This was also published at ASCO in poster, though I don't think there was no oral on this. But this is chemoimmunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. So same group of patients. These guys were given nivolumab, plus I think it was patitaxel carboplatin, two cycles, followed by surgery, with the option of adjuvant nivolumab if you wanted to. And the numbers, I think, are quite impressive. So to date, 46 patients have undergone, 41 of the 46 patients included in the study have undergone surgery. All had an R0 resection. 
And the NPR rate in this study was 83%. So 34 out of 41 patients who had their disease resected had less than 10% of viable tumour cells in their cancer at the time of surgery, which I think is quite remarkable. And of those, 24 had a pathological complete response. No active tumour in the resected specimen. So I think this is quite remarkable data, I have to say, and puts into context the other two studies we've just talked about. On the back of that, there's a whole raft of studies now looking at neoadjuvant chemo, <laughs> chemoimmunotherapy in lung cancer. Some of you may be taking part in these, and over the next couple of years, I suspect we'll have our answer as to which, if any, of these regimens is, is effective. So in summary then, uh, from my talks, adjuvant pemetrexid cisplatin is less toxic and le as effective in navel bean cisplatin with the caveats around the EGFR mutation positive patients. Metformin doesn't appear to <coughs> add any benefit in concurrent chemo radiotherapy. I think the evidence that we have shows that neoadjuvant immunotherapy does pack a punch and can be an effective treatment or maybe an effective treatment. However, the early data, data that we have suggests that combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy may be a better approach. And the phase three trials going forward are all looking at that combination rather than single agent immunotherapy. Thank you very much. It usually is the winner. Is, I, I, th I think it, it usually is the winner. I th we've had problems recruiting to neoadjuvant studies before because patients often want the tumour out, surgeons want to take the tumour out, and oncologists quite reasonably are, are a bit twitchy about the delaying definitive treatment. So I think it is likely that the majority of patients will get adjuvant treatment still rather than neoadjuvant treatment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we answered the question. The metformin study, I was really struck by that schedule. <coughs> Am I right in thinking? that the concurrent chemo radiation started with radiotherapy and chemo on day one. Yes, so there was an induction and phase for the metformin for two weeks. And so the chemo went on beyond, beyond the radio Four cycles. radiotherapy. Yeah. So in the UK, who does that? Well, now we've got Pacific. I used to do that. I'm probably old fashioned, but Pacific has mandated that we get the immunotherapy in more quickly than that. So most people are only using two cycles of chemotherapy. There's radiation oncologists in the room, David May, have a view on this. Yeah, so I've changed my practice now. I've sh shortened the amount of chemotherapy I give and get them straight on to doing it. What I'm getting at is that my sense is quite a lot of people start chemo very quickly. Yeah. And then the radiation may start subsequently to cycle one of chemo. I think there's two reasons That's for what doing I'm that. Reason number one is resources. If you can get the patient on chemo more quickly, then there's a, there's a, there's a drive to start some form of treatment whether it be the right thing to do or not is a, is a moot point. There's also those groups of patients where the radiation oncologist may look at the scan and go, mm, I'm not sure whether I can get that into a radiation portal, give them some chemo first and see what happens. I think in the ideal world, and I try to, if someone is treatable with a radical intent at the outset, I will start the chemotherapy and radiotherapy on day one. But a lot of centres can't do that because of resource issues. Okay, thank you. In the interest of time, I'd like to thank Jason very much for your update. Jason. Thank you.